All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, good evening. And on behalf of the American Visionary Art Museum, I want to welcome you to tonight's virtual program, Creativity in Place, an Introduction to Art Environments. Um, just a few Zoom reminders. Please use our chat below um, to send in some questions. Um, we are going to be answering questions throughout the presentation, so feel free um, to put your question in the chat. We do have closed captions available. If you mouse down um, to the bottom of your Zoom area, you can turn on the closed captionings as needed. Um, right, and we are recording this presentation, so um, we'll upload it to our YouTube um, probably within a week or so. So just an FYI, if you have to log off early. Um, so we have an amazing presenter this evening. Annalise Flynn is an independent curator and art historian. She manages the Spaces Archive on behalf of the Kohler Foundation. The Spaces website is amazing. I'm going to drop it in the chat um, when I'm finished talking. It's an amazing website that serves as basically an encyclopedia of artists made environments and even shows you the status of the environment, um, if you can visit still and all that good stuff. Um, so I'm really excited to have Annalise here to tell us more about um, her research and her art environments that she's visited. So I'll turn it over to you, Annalise. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, well, I am so excited to be here. I'm so grateful to the American Visionary Art Museum for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I am coming to you from my home in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, as you can probably tell from the Christmas tree behind me. Um, there are some dogs around. Hopefully they will be quiet. They're not being quiet right now, but they will calm down. <laughs> Um, it is such a gift to get to share my work um, and the work of some extremely talented artists with all of you tonight. So thank you to AVAM for letting me do this. Um, just by way of some more introductions, uh, I'm from Mississippi originally, but I have been based in the Midwest for almost 20 years. Uh, and I now live in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, where one of my roles is managing spaces on behalf of the Kohler Foundation. Um, I'm also working with the Arts Foundation of Kosciuszko on the forthcoming LV Hall Legacy Center in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, which I will share more about later. Um, and I was recently asked to contribute to the current AVAM exhibition, If You Build It, They Will Come. So when you go see that exhibition, you will see a little bit of my writing there. So I wanted to start by sharing a little bit about SPACES. So SPACES stands for Saving and Preserving Arts and Cultural Environments, and it is dedicated to the study, documentation, and preservation of art environments around the world. It was founded in 1978 by Seymour Rosen, who is a photographer, curator, and cultural advocate. Um, Seymour was interested in any and all expressions of human creativity from storefront churches, decorated cars, existential messages left under overpasses, public celebrations, and his largest and arguably most important body of work was documentation of Simon Rodia's Watts Towers and many, many other art environments. And the reason I wanted to introduce Seymour is because of how integral his work was to the recognition of art environments as art. And not only as art, but also as art made by artists worthy of support and creating places worthy of preservation. He started Spaces because at the time there were no other institutions dedicated to the work of environment creators on a national and eventually an international scale. Though it's important to note that uh, there were other folks working in this sphere. The Kohler Foundation was just getting started with their efforts to preserve art environments. Um, they preserved Fred Smith's Wisconsin Concrete Park in 1976 and have gone on to preserve many more environments throughout the country. Um, and there were other regional organizations working at that time, like the Kansas Grassroots Art Association in Kansas and the Jargon Society in the Southeast. Seymour's focus, though, was connecting with artists, providing support where he could, and advocating for their work to be preserved once they had left the site or passed away. He was an integral member of the committee for Simon Rodia's Towers and Watts that leapt into action when the city of Los Angeles deemed the towers unsafe and tried to have them demolished. 
the towers are still standing, the committee was successful, and this provided a model for Seymour's future efforts. Though the towers were technically safe, uh, throughout the following years, he saw many artist environments in California not receiving that same level of attention. He thought he would do the work of spaces for about five years, um, and establish a broader network of support and understanding, and then a bigger institu institution would come in and take this work off of his hands. But that is not exactly what happened. Um, he continued to work for Spaces until he passed away in 2006. Uh, Spaces was then taken over by curator and scholar Jofar Hernandez, who was dedicated to the archive for more than a decade. And in 2019, the archive was acquired as a preservation project of the Kohler Foundation and moved in its entirety to Wisconsin. Um, and that is when I started in 2019. Spaces is both a physical and digital archive. This is a screenshot of the homepage of the website. Um, I invite you to visit the website. Uh, we have more than 800 artists that have been documented. There's a map feature where you can plan your next road trip to visit some of the sites we're gonna look at today. Um, and we've been very lucky to talk to lots of folks doing incredible work in this sphere, and you can find a lot of those conversations in the blog. Uh, so with that being said, what is an art environment? So an art environment, my personal definition that I use for an art environment is it is a combination of art, architecture, and or landscape architecture, including religious grottos, spiritual, devotional, and mystical sites, gardens, ephemeral yard shows, architectural inventions, expressions of loneliness and survival, homes fully transformed, artist museums, and many other created spaces. So they are personal spaces like homes, gardens, and studios, fully transformed into continually evolving site-specific and life-encompassing works of art. So given that the title of this presentation is Creativity in Place, I'm going to start with Leonard Knight's Salvation Mountain, which is near and dear to my heart. I wrote my master's thesis on Salvation Mountain and I could spend much more than an hour talking about just this site, but we're gonna move through it pretty quickly. Um, Salvation Mountain is a very strong example of site spe specificity, uh, as I don't believe the Salvation Mountain could have happened anywhere else on earth. Uh, creating Salvation Mountain was not Knight's original intention, however, um, his original intention was creating a homemade hot air balloon. The inspiration first appeared to him when a hot air balloon flew over his hometown of Burlington, Vermont in 1970, and he noticed everyone gleefully watching this balloon flow by. For the next 10 years, Knight traveled back and forth between Vermont and Southern California, working odd jobs and speaking to churches in an attempt to gain support for his dream of a hot air balloon that would, quote, advertise the Lord Jesus. During his travels, Knight ended up in Nebraska, where he was able to acquire scrap material from a nearby hot air balloon manufacturing plant. This is the balloon. While living and working in a three-sided shack, he struggled with the construction of the balloon for more than 10 years before heading south to Slab City, California to attempt flight without fear of inclement weather or potentially folks stepping in and saying, hey, you can't fly that giant balloon here. Every time he tried to inflate the balloon, it would rip and Knight knew, quote, right then that the balloon was just plain rotting out on me. And here is a photo of a later attempt to inflate the balloon taken by Seymour. You can see in the background, there are a bunch of people that have come to Leonard's aid. They are pulling this 200 foot balloon up this hill and working very hard to get it inflated. Um, this is one of my favorite photos from this effort. So these are a couple of folks who are inside of the balloon and I believe they have tape and are taping the holes up um, as they are bursting open. And everyone is also wor working together to push air up into the channels of this balloon. But unfortunately the balloon never flew. Um, and Knight decided to instead create a monument to his decade-long project on the site of this failed flight attempt. The small monument started with just a bag of cement 
and eventually grew to become Salvation Mountain, a 100 foot long, three story tall adobe sculpture built into the face of an existing ridge in the Sonoran Desert. Knight estimated he used more than 100,000 gallons of paint on the mountain he created to share his message of love. And now I want to share a short video so that we can hear from Leonard himself. And just so folks know, you know, it's possible um, through uh, showing this that the video might be a little bit choppy, but I hope that you can hear the words of Leonard. That's um, the most important part. And then Becca will also put the link to this in the chat. So if you want to watch it later on your own, you can do so. I've been here 30 years, about 18 years on that big God is Love Mountain, and about 17 years on a museum in there. And people took a liking to the mountain a lot, and I'm excited that people come in by the hundreds sometimes and just take pictures of it. And I got dedicated about 50 years ago, and God Almighty knows I wanted to work for him. I get excited about putting God is love to the whole world. God loves everybody in the whole world, period. That's everybody. That's all people everywhere, period. Love can get so big that it can cover everybody in the whole world if you allow it. And if we just learn to live it and love everybody, and we don't get into one one denomination and figure that all the other ones are not going to make it. God is a universal God. A lot of people are love me, and this mountain is known. And somebody told me on the internet there's over a hundred different countries now that know about the mountain here and now. So it's slowly getting out there. People are loving me mainly now. I think it's because of the message. It's an easy message. To love somebody is the most easy thing in the world to do. Just love somebody. Be nice to them. And all of a sudden, that guy's going to be nice back to you. And nice gets bigger. Woo! And it's going to spread the whole world. Love is going to do it. So that was Leonard. And um, whenever I have the opportunity to have, you know, people hear directly from the artist, I, I like to do that. Um, you know, in the research that I do, any sort of materials, interviews with artists that I can use is the very first thing that I go to. And um, generally what they have to say about their work is a lot more interesting and important than what I have to say. So um, I hope that, you know, that clip worked for y'all. Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, I think the Sonoran Desert in California, in Imperial County, California, is the only place the Salvation Mountain could have been created. Um, and so to provide some context on the place, um, while Leonard was living in Nebraska, he heard that Slab City was a safe place to inflate the balloon, probably through, I'm assuming, some sort of word of mouth network, people who were traveling around and looking for a safe place to be. Um, before I move on to that, I do want to point out this like beautiful photo of Leonard by Ted Degner. Ted, I saw is here. Hi, Ted. Um, Ted has created some of the most stunning portraiture of artists in their environments that I've ever seen. Um, and some of that work is also on view at ABAM. So um, when you go to ABAM, also look out for Ted's work. 
So Slab City, uh, known as the last free place, was created on the slabs of um, a military um, operation called Camp Dunlap. Um, and is owned by the state of California. It was owned by the state of California then, it's owned by the state of California now. Um, you can see the slabs in the distance back behind the mountain back here. So the slabs accepted Leonard as a part of their community. Um, the reason that Leonard stayed was because they were bringing him material. Uh, he you know, only had a bag of cement. He was gonna create something very small in commemoration of the balloon, but these people really accepted him. They wanted to help him. Um, they befriended him. And so he decided to stay. Um, without the encouragement and the camaraderie of the folks in Slab City, it's extremely unlikely that Leonard, someone who had up until this point lived a relatively itinerant life, or at least lived in a place long enough to complete the project like the balloon and then moved on. Um, it's unlikely that he would have stayed in Nyland, California for the 28 years that he spent creating and performing the daily maintenance that the existence of the mountain required. And I think to zoom out even further, it's important to also understand the very specific conditions that created and allow for the continuation of Slab City. So this is an aerial view of the Salton Sea, which is the largest body of water in the state of California. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to share all the details about how the Salton Sea came to be, which is too bad because it's extremely interesting. Um, if you want to learn more, I highly recommend the film Plagues and Pleasures on the Salton Sea. Uh, it is available on YouTube. It is narrated by John Waters, so the native son of Baltimore. So definitely check that out whenever you get a chance. Um, but long story short, the Salton Sea is a result of one of the largest man-made ecological disasters in the United States, if not the world. Um, essentially, in the early 1800s, developers decided to irrigate this land for agriculture. This land was uh, formerly known as the Salton Sink. It was um, oceanic a very long time ago, and so all of those minerals in that soil created what they thought at the time would be great conditions for farming. Um, so as you can see in this very verdant grid adjacent to the lake, um, the agriculture is ongoing um, and the engineering mistake that was originally happened as part of this irrigation flooded what used to be the dry basin that was 10 miles long and three miles wide resulting in the Salton Sea. So since then, this land has faced exponentially growing challenges, eco environmental challenges, um, and the people living there have essentially been discarded. Um, this county has one of, if not the highest unemployment rates in the country. Um, given the lack of attention and interest, interest uh, Slab City, a squatter's village, has been allowed to exist for decades when most other municipalities would have destroyed it by now. And I wanted to tell that very quick version of the story of how the sea created the conditions for Slab City and Slab City created the conditions for Leonard to create Salvation Mountain, because I think it's such an incredible example of just how connected art environments are to the time and the place and the communities in which they're made. This wasn't just one man that wandered into the desert. Um, he was an artist who was deeply embedded in community. And though he passed away in 2015, the mountain continues to stand only because of the ongoing dedication to the site from that community. Salvation Mountain is now managed by a board of directors that was instated while Knight was still living. And though the state of California owns the land, the board has done an incredible job at maintaining Knight's art artwork, as you can see from this photo that I took last March. Uh, this work is primarily performed by the site caretaker, Ron Malinowski, who, if you wanna follow him, he is Salvation Mountain Man on Instagram. Um, the board currently hopes to secure the future of the site through purchasing this property from the state, and they just received a county historic designation that will hopefully support that effort. And then to stay up to date on the mountain as a whole, you can follow them at Salvation Mountain Official on Instagram. 
And then regarding Leonard's amazing balloon, Leonard visited the American Visionary Art Museum in 1996 for an exhibition of one of his trucks and the balloon. And it was decided um, that AVAM could use portions of his original balloon to create a smaller version for display in the museum, um, which is this pictured here. Uh, I just had the chance to see the balloon for the first time um, last October. Uh, it's gorgeous and I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't seen it before. I just had a question before you move on, Annalise. Can you, how did he, I mean, how did he live? That? Like, how did he live on that mountain, like in those conditions in that desert? Um, I think we can also credit that to Slab City. Um, Slab City is an extremely cooperative community. Everybody um, pitches in in some way. Generally, they're known uh, what they do is in their name. So there's Builder Bill, who was a builder. There's Solar Mike, who supplied solar panels, um, wow. that kind of thing. And so, you know, generally people are, are helping each other out. Um, Leonard was a veteran, so he had a very small pension. Um, and obviously he wasn't paying rent or a mortgage or a phone bill or anything. So he really did exist um, on that small pension. He lived in uh, the one of the trucks that I showed mm -hmm. before, um, or sometimes he slept outside. And he had a bike and he would go into town and he would grab food or grab coffee. So he was just, yeah, he was just living the desert lifestyle out there. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I want to move on. We're going to travel south, east. Um, and I want to talk about LV Hall now because I was just talking about preservation. Um, you know, and in Salvation Mountain, we've seen a pretty incredible example of people gathering together to preserve something that um, I think most at one point in time at least would have said is unpreservable. Um, so with that said, I want to introduce LV Hall in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. This is LV. Um, pictured in her environment in front of her home, so her front porch that she's standing on. Um, LV purchased her home in 1974 with wages from domestic work when she was in her early 30s. She was an artist her entire life, but it wasn't until she had access to her own space that her practice really took off in remarkable ways. She started as a collector, filling her home with precious items, some that she kept um, for curated displays within her home and others that she sold to other collectors. She eventually began painting using primarily found objects as her canvas and acrylic paint from Walmart. She developed a signature style, bright concentrated colors and dots, clever sayings, and she called this quote, doing the LV. She also called the discrete pieces that she made her pretty things. And then she even adorned herself in her work, painting many hats and pairs of shoes and clothing. A visitor once said that they weren't sure where the art stopped and LV started. Her artwork began to radiate outward into her front yard, eventually becoming a dense, evolving, prismatic installation. Like Leonard, LV utilized the material she had on hand or that were easily accessible. For Leonard, it was donated house paint and dirt. And for LV, it was household objects and personal objects she would find, purchase, or receive as gifts that received the treatment of her signature dot style. One of the hallmarks of most art environments is that they're always changing and they're never quite complete. This was definitely true of LV's yard. Uh, we've heard stories of people in town who, when they were kids, would beg their you know, parents after they pick them up for school, will you drive me by um, LV's house so that they could see what had changed since the last time that they had um, visited her installation. Not everyone appreciated LV in her yard, but she was beloved by many and her home was a beacon of creativity and personal pride in her historically African-American neighborhood. Like Leonard, she was an active part of her community and created a space not only for private meditation, but also to welcome friends and neighbors to exchange plates of food and probably gossip. And also like Salvation Mountain, her home attracted visitors from all over the world. 
And so now I also want to take the opportunity to hear from LV. So I'm going to share the trailer for Love is a Sensation. It's an affectionate one hour documentary by filmmaker Yafit Smith. Yafit is also here. So hey, Yafit, thanks for coming. Um, Smith's grandmother lived right down the street from Hall and he was frequently in town visiting family um, when he met and he met Hall when he was a kid, only five or six years old. And he credits her as being the first person who exemplified living a creative life. So later as an adult pursuing his own creativity, he started filming Hall uh, from 2001 to 2004. And that footage will now be um, this one hour documentary, which is currently in post-production. So here we go. Sometimes you can be down and out. Somebody will come along and you forget about what they The unusual artists. LV, who is that? So that one of my wig. Let me show you how I look when you know. I know I ain't pretty, but I actually look presentable sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's the Eagle, California. Denver, Colorado, Louisville, Kentucky, New Orleans, Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Switzerland. That's the most German. As his boy was going away, he was trying to tell us to take care of his bicycle. That's what he was trying to say. This so building keep on leaning. I got to move to a better home. So who? University of the Peoples of Patala County got on my nerve. Love is a sensation started by a conversation, spread by the population, and hush like an operation. Who does love you? But Milda love me. Yeah. Oh, that man found me up on the Are you going to find him up? Dear Mr. King, I love Miss R.V. I think you would enjoy visiting with her. And I might tell him, do not try to understand me, Mr. B.B. King. Just love me. <laughs> <laughs> So again, I with you know, like with the earlier video, I don't know if the streaming quality was very good, but I hope that you were at least able to hear um LV's voice. Um, and I believe Becca is going to put the link or already has put the link. Yes, she did already put the link, um, in the chat. If folks want to watch that on their own later and definitely stay tuned, um, for the release of the full film. It's pretty incredible. Um, so as I mentioned, we were talking about preservation. Um, so now LV's home and a collection of her work are going to be the foundation of a new arts campus right in her neighborhood in Kosciuszko. Like Salvation Mountain, their survival of LV's artwork was also dependent on the community that loved her and supported her creativity. After she passed away in 2008, a friends group was formed to settle her estate with her sister QT. They carefully collected and packaged as much of the artwork, as much of this artwork as possible, and stored it in Kosciuszko, hoping for an eventual opportunity to create a space to display the collection in LV's honor. 
So fast forward to 2022, the Kohler Foundation was able to take on that collection that the Friends Group had saved as a preservation project. They conserved the collection and gifted it back to a new nonprofit organization called the Arts Foundation of Kosciuszko. With Kohler Foundation support, the Arts Foundation was able to purchase a lot at the end of Hall Street for the development of a new art center called the LV Hall Legacy Center. So this is an, an aerial view here of the neighborhood and um, what you see in yellow is the future campus of the LV Hall Legacy Center and circled in purple is LV's original home. So you can see they are extremely close together, um, definitely walking distance between the two of those. Um, this road, Huntington coming in, connects with the Natchez Trace, which connects with downtown Kosciuszko. Um, one of the primary goals of the Legacy Center, um, the creation of the Legacy Center was to be accessible to the folks in LV's neighborhood. Um, hence this being uh, really the perfect location to display the collection of LV's work, to, to host an artist in residence, um, to have other creative programming um, and to welcome the community. And the goal for this overall project, the Legacy Center, as well as the home, which will be preserved, um, is to be a monument to LV's creative spirit, her independence, her warmth, and her exceptional generosity. The Legacy Center will be anchored by LV's home, um, which I you know, showed you is right down the street. It was added this past year to the National Trust for Historic Preservation's list of America's 11 most endangered historic places, and preservation of the home um, is slated to begin very soon. And so I wanted to take a minute to emphasize how rare this is, um, the preservation of the home of a Black woman artist in the South. Um, it is exceptionally rare. There are, of course, other women who created environments in the South. Uh, Mary Tillman Smith, who is also in Mississippi, and Nellie Mae Rowe in Georgia are some examples. Rowe's home was demolished shortly after her death, and the status of Tillman's home is not totally clear. It's possible that it remains in her family. So while the goal um, of preserving Hull's home is not to attempt to recreate her environment in its entirety on the site, its role as the center of her creative practice as the, quote, spiritual cornerstone of the Legacy Center, as my colleague Yafit says, will be made abundantly clear through interpretation and programming on site. So now I'm going to transition to two artists who are continuing to create their environments, starting with Oyami Dabbles and the Dabbles Bead Museum in Detroit. So Dabbles, pictured here, has been creating the Dabbles African Bead Museum since 1998. He was born in Mississippi in 1948, just under an hour from Kosciuszko, actually, where LV was. Um, following the path of the Great Migration, his family relocated to the booming industrial town of Detroit in 1965. Dabbles began his career as a draftsman with General Motors, but soon thereafter was unfortunately disabled by a car accident. Um, art therapy during his convalescence led him to pursue painting at Wayne State University. He then began his art career um, in 1975 as an artist in residence at the second African American History Museum in the country, then called the Afro American Museum and now the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. He stayed with the museum for another 15 years and while there he began to see African artwork and cultural materials presented through a colonial European lens. Witnessing the gross misunderstanding of these materials, Dabbles was inspired to create a place in Detroit where he could celebrate African heritage through thoughtfully sharing African material public, uh, African material culture with the public. So this is the exterior of the African Bead Museum. Um, Dabbles uh, offers several ways for visitors to interact with the artwork. Um, firstly, through visiting the, the interior of the Bead Museum here, where there are actually beads um, for purchase. Um, and you will often find Dabbles sitting at the desk inside. He's very available to share his story and discuss the significance of his artwork um, and tell you more about the, the beads on view. Dabble's work expands onto a large green lot, um, very large, two city blocks worth, um, right behind his shop. So this is looking back toward the shop um, where that 
chimney is rising on the right, um, that is actually where the bead museum is. Um, art environments often take the shape of the artist's home or property and Dabble's access to this expansive property enabled him to have the space to work big and to give his separate tableaus room to breathe. And this is another view um, of the property and you can see sort of the, the separate spaces for his um, sculptural, sculptural installations. And then this is an aerial of the site and then this shows um, the full layout, again, just how expansive it is. Um, you can see that the, the bead museum is down here. Um, this whole section is iron teaching rocks how to rust. That's the name of the multiple installations that are here. Um, back here is the Nkisi um, iron house installation and the African language wall is back here. This installation comprising a series of individual tableaus tells the story of European colonization of Africans using the traditional materials of iron, rock, wood, and mirror. Ongoing disinvestment in the city of Detroit led to the demolition of many buildings, making these materials abundantly available for reuse. Uh, this aligns with another urban environment, Kia Tawana's Ark in Newark, New Jersey. Um, another city facing extreme blight, uh, Kia worked as a one woman demolition crew and used the material she salvaged from these um, empty buildings in Newark to build herself an ark. Unfortunately, in an effort to quote, clean up the city, uh, the city forced her to dismantle the structure in 1989. This photo is also by Ted, who I mentioned earlier. Of Dabble's four primary materials, he said, quote, we can't live without iron. In fact, there's enough iron in each of us to make a three inch nail. We also can't live without the trees and modern day science is finding that we are more like trees than we ever imagined. Rocks are the basis of everything around us. We may call them crystals and healing or precious stones now, but they're still just rocks. And mirrors really fascinated me. When you look in the mirror, the image you see is reversed. So you can never really see yourself the way other people see you by looking at a mirror. So I began to use the mirrors to make people a part of the installation and saw all kinds of reactions, but mostly smiles, end quote. Um, we have a good question. Um, does he live like in the bead museum or near it? Um, where does he live? Um, I think he lives uh, near the bead bead museum like this is his home neighborhood but I'm not sure that his home is on site got it um in these installations you see rocks receiving instruction at a dinner table and in a classroom through these works dabbles illustrates colonial methods of forced assimilation and I wanna quickly mention another artist who uses their site as a place to celebrate and commemorate African-American culture. Uh, Dr. Charles Smith's African-American Heritage Museum and Black Veterans Archive in Hammond, Louisiana. Dr. Charles Smith pictured here at his first site in Aurora, Illinois in 1996 is a veteran educator and artist and has dedicated much of his life to the creation of a sculptural encapsulation of his view of the African-American experience, the African-American uh, Heritage Museum and Black Veterans Archive. It was first located in Aurora, Illinois, but in 2000, Dr. Smith decided to disassemble the site and many of those sculptures were gifted to institutions around the United States via the Kohler Foundation. Soon thereafter, Dr. Smith began developing a new site in Hammond, Louisiana, where he works today. His work is primarily figurative sculptures representing important moments in Black history from the Middle Passage through the Civil Rights Movement to the events of today. Back to Detroit. Uh, while all of Dabble's work is stunning, the jewel of the site is absolutely the Nkisi house pictured here. The Nkisi is completely adorned in artwork. It is an enormous masterwork that appears to split into interrelated assemblages and paintings as you approach. Um, African art scholar Robert Ferris Thompson wrote in his seminal book, Flash of the Spirit, African and Afro-American art and 
philosophy um, that in Simi Isaki's definition of Nkisi is, quote, the name of the thing we use to help a person when that person is sick and from which we obtain help to prote protect the human soul and guard it against illness. And Nkisi is also a chosen companion in whom all people find confidence. It is a hiding place for people's souls to keep and compose in order to preserve life. And I think, you know, on this structure, you can see Dabble's mastery of texture. And I just wanted to flip through uh, a few details of the site. And just a note, all the photos, if not otherwise um, credited, um, I, they were taken by me. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, how many, it says, how many artworks has the Kohler saved? Um, but maybe like how many environments have they saved? And are they, do they just like absorb them into their museum or are they then like put back? Like, can you explain that a little bit, how that works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, just um, as a note, I'm a contractor for the Kohler Foundation, so I can describe how, they're, how they work, but I don't speak on their behalf. Um, but the way that the Kohler Foundation usually structures their preservation projects is that um, a, an art environment, a site, you know, or a collection is gifted to the Kohler Foundation. Um, they conserve that site or collection, and then they gift it back to a nonprofit steward who uh, manages that site or that collection in perpetuity. So, you know, for example, I mentioned earlier the LV Hall collection. So what happened there is the Friends Group had this collection of work. They gave it to the Kohler Foundation. The Kohler Foundation conserved um, and cataloged and photographed that collection. And then they gifted it to a new organization, the Arts Foundation of Kosciuszko. Um, and with Kohler support, uh, they purchased that land to create the LV Hall Legacy Center. So that's generally the model. Um, you can definitely go to the Kohler Foundation website. It's kohlerfoundation.org um, to see their preserved sites. That's a, just a section of the website. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, they started in 1976 with Fred Smith's um, Wisconsin Concrete Park. That was an effort driven by Ruth DeYoung Kohler, um, who was the director at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center for, I think, more than 50 years here in Sheboygan um, and passed away recently. Um, and Ruth was, you know, I didn't mention Ruth earlier, I should have, was a staunch supporter of art environments and was really one of the people, along with Seymour, who was leading the effort to recognize these as places of art making and also um, advocate for their preservation. Um, but yeah, check out the Kohler Foundation website. You'll see a bunch of other places that they've um, preserved. They do really, really um, incredible Thank you. I put the um, link in the chat for everyone so they can go there. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, so yeah, back to Dabbles, just showing a couple more of um, these detail shots of the site. Um, you know, this is a place that I think you could visit uh, hundreds of times and discover something new every time you go. That's probably true of um, every art environment, but I think it's especially true here. And then, you know, I mentioned earlier that Dabble's, um, his ability to work with texture, um, and I think that extends into the shop here. So you can see this is the interior of the bead museum. This is just a selection of some of the beads that are on display um, and that are for sale. It's pretty stunning. So Dabbles is currently fundraising to further expand the site and its accessibility to the community. Um, so you can see this is a rendering that I pulled uh, from the website, um, www.imbad.org. And then this is a zoomed out rendering that shows a little bit more about the hopes for the site in terms of um, expanded uh, area for artwork, landscaping, there's a basketball court, um, an expanded African language wall in the back. Um, and so they are currently fundraising for this and you can go to that website and learn more about this project. 
And speaking of community, I felt I would be remiss to not mention the Heidelberg Project while we're in Detroit. Fellow Wayne State University alum Tyree Guyton began creating his, in his environment on Heidelberg Street in Detroit in 1986 after returning home from service in the U.S. Army to find the neighborhood in a severe state of dilapidation. There is so much to the story of Guyton's work, um, but it was always a community project at heart and a place for neighbors to come exercise their own creativity and feel a sense of pride in their home. When I visited Detroit in July of 2021, um, I was able to meet both Dabbles and, and Guyton separately. Um, and they both volunteered the same philosophy about their connection to their community, um, that neither would support fences being erected around their work. Um, and I was so struck by this that I didn't bring this up with either of these artists and both of them separately brought up to me how important it was that these were places to be shared um, and that both artists share the core value of extending trust to the communities around them. So again, a lot more to learn about this site and you can visit their website, heidelberg.org. So the last artist I wanted to talk about today um, is Shari Tuska. So we're heading back closer to my home in Sheboygan, Wisconsin to wrap up. Um, so now we are in Milwaukee at Shari Tuska's home, which she has dubbed her Wayward Garden. Though Tuska had always been a creative person, she began creating this type of work uh, quite serendipitously. She had beach combed for sea glass and other materials since she was a teen, but it wasn't until she discovered a book on the work of Antony Gaudi that she realized how she could activate that collection. And so here is um, Gaudi's work, Park Rule in Barcelona. And in terms of inspiration, Tesca is in great company. Uh, Nikki de St. Fall uh, visited Park Ghoul in her 20s and went on to create her own mosaic environment, the Tarot Garden in Italy's Tuscan countryside, which I very much recommend visiting if you find yourself in Italy. So back in Milwaukee, um, like many of the other artists we've looked at today, Tuska's work is about connection, but of a much more in intimate variety. Um, a deep listening to her own creative intuition. Tuska refers to her practice as, quote, serendipitous collaboration. She remains open to the influences of the world around her, channeling, e channeling them into each of her sculptures, most of which are reference to women of antiquity who were maligned and oppressed due to their perceived power and influence. Tuska's practice is also very much rooted in place in the sense that she brings place to her. Once Tuska is introduced to a place or figure that piques her it curiosity, she will spend about a year researching before she travels to that location, um, usually on her own. And once there, she lets that serendipitous part of her process take over, often leading her to unexpected results. When she returns home, she takes those influences and allows them to coalesce into artwork she installs both outside and inside of her home. And it was really important to me to present Tuska's work um, alongside these other makers, as there is a, a common misconception that art environments are only created by men and also that they aren't happening anymore that people are not still making them um, tuska is a woman working right now um, and time will only tell how much her site continues to evolve um, and now that we've seen this variety of sites i think it's also important to know how critical it is to have access to a space of one's own to create this kind of artwork um, Tuska has carved out this space in her backyard in Milwaukee, and against many odds, L.V. Hall was able to do the same in Mississippi in 1975. Both of these sites are visible to the people who might be looking for them, but there's no telling how many interior environments by women um, have been lost. And I think that is probably one of the reasons why there is this common misconception is that women were working inside and that we just don't know about all the wonderful things, all the wonderful environments that they have made and we never will. So speaking of those who might be looking, 
Um, I wanted to add a disclaimer now that uh, Tusca site is not open to the public, but if you'd like to visit, you can get in touch with spaces at info at spacesarchives.org and we will pass your request along to her. And then for the sites that I've mentioned that are open to the public, so Salvation Mountain, Dabble's Bead Museum, and soon to be the LV Hall Legacy Center, we're hoping to have some of that facility open by this November. Um, I strongly urge you to experience these places for yourself. Uh, my goal tonight was in part to demonstrate how important place is to the work of these artists. And that being said, the magic of art environments is really in being there. Thank you. I love this picture. <laughs> we love Leonard. Did you meet Leonard Knight? I started my research the year after he passed away. So no, I didn't. I just barely missed him. Um, let's see. We had some questions. So the last artist, Sherry May Tuska, does she use um, like cement forms under those mosaics? Do you know? We'll just use as underneath of them. Um, she does create an armature underneath. Um, and I think actually she's probably in the chat right now. So, uh, sorry oh. if I am not. <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> if I am not representing your work accurately, uh, please pop in and say. But I do believe she creates armatures underneath and then uses cement and mortar. And then, um, one of the really great things about uh, Shari's practice is that you know, like I said, she beach combs. So um, mm -hmm. she beach combs in um, actually in the Kohler Andre area. People from this area will know where that is. It's close to Milwaukee. But she also will beach comb in the places that she travels to and bring those you know suitcases of materials back with her and then implement that on um, her sculptures. That's amazing. Um. I love it. Let's see what else we've got in here. Um, I also dropped, or that tarot garden in Italy, you just mentioned that, that briefly. Um, I'll have to see if they have a website. Um, have you been to visit that as well? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. That's wild. Um, yeah, <laughs> I uh, was extremely lucky to be able to go to the tarot garden um, the summer before last. And uh, there is a website. Um, it is open to the public. Um, it is amazing. It covers, I don't know, some amount of um, acreage. Um, there are giant sculptures representing all of the major figures of tarot, but then there are other smaller sculptures all around the property as well. And it is really, really stunning. And the story of Nikki to St. Paul, I mean, that's a whole other thing um, to uh, to look into. Um, Nikki was, you know, a popular artist um, who was, you know, at one point, I think, um, not taken seriously because of her artwork being very overtly feminine. Um, and right. so she then moved into creating commercial products and then she used the um, money she made off of those commercial project products to fund um, a large portion of the tarot garden. So she said, you know, like, fine, I'll do it myself. And she did. Yeah, I know. I'm just like, even from this little picture, there's just so much, there's just so much to see. So I can only imagine what it would be like. Yeah. Cause these visiting these sites, I'm sure it's just over, you know, it's just stimulation, like overload, you know? Um, Cause yeah, I mean, these are humongous, you know, when the work is even bigger than you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just... Well, and I definitely, you know, advocate for people to, if they have the opportunity to visit, you know, sites more than once, you know, I mean, it is the first time you go to a place it is really overwhelming. And especially if you've been a fan for a while, if it's something you've been thinking about for a long time. Um, so I think, you know, on return visits is maybe when things really start to to sink in. Um, I went to um, Noah Purifoy's site in Joshua Tree last year and didn't have that long to be there. And the only thing I could think about the whole time was like, oh my God, I want to see this at every time of day and I want to spend hours here. Um, so lots of opportunities. Well, um, let's see. I had, well, I was thinking about LV Hall. Um, how was her site 
you know, like discovered, like how did, was just like the community got the word out and then she, it was like an attraction for people coming through town. Um, I'm just curious because I had never heard of her site before. Sure. Um, so, you know, LB's work was very visible. It was in her front yard. So obviously there was a word of mouth spread um, about her work. Um, it was featured in a couple of books, I think first in, I want to say the early nineties and it was a couple of like guides to Mississippi. Um, I believe that's how Ted Degner said he originally found her work because Ted has also photographed LV um, and did some recording of her. Um, and so, you know, there are people like Ted who um, are super into road tripping and, and finding art environments. And so a lot of times they will scour those kinds of materials like local state guides. Um, mm -hmm. LV, you know, from there, you know, I think she received a lot of local attention, local press. Um, and then she was also in the Souls Grown Deep volume two um, by Bill mm -hmm. Arnett. Um, her environment was in that second volume. Excellent. Um, let's see another question. Oh, okay. Somebody's asking, um, how do we get a space um an art environment listed on the spaces website if you're you know if you know of a place that isn't on there is there a way to like submit them yeah 100 percent. i love that question um you can get in touch with info at spaces archives.org um that is our email address and it's me i'm on the other end of that um and just let me know i you know one of the things that was um the mo or the thing actually that was the most surprising about starting this work is that I had assumed that spaces kind of just knew about, you know, most of the environments that were out there. And, you know, while there are hundreds and hundreds of sites documented on spaces, I am shocked by how often I hear about something that I didn't know about before and that is not included in any documentation in spaces. So um, we love to hear about new things. Please tell us. Oh, wow. All right. Well, you put the word, you put the word out. So hopefully um, you'll get some more. Sorry, I'm just looking. Yeah. If you want to look in the chat, there's a, a lot of um, comments about other environments. Um, and yeah, we're so excited that Ted is on this call um, and seeing yeah, and having his beautiful yeah his beautiful yeah, photography in the exhibition oh, yeah. um yeah all right well last call for questions if anyone has any other questions um this presentation has been recorded and will be uploaded to avm's youtube page it might take us um a week or so to get that uploaded um but yeah it'll be up there along with all of our other virtual programs um yeah. So Annalise, thank you so, so much. I think this was fascinating. Everyone, I think is just, you know, taking it all in and we're going to be looking out for those um, environments. Maybe there's some more in the Baltimore area and beyond. You never know. Um, I would love to hear about anything in Baltimore. Please let me know. <laughs> um, I just put the uh, email in the chat again, info at spaces. So I welcome anybody that has any questions about any of this so please reach out i'm very happy to chat anytime yeah let me just i'll drop that spaces archives dot org and yeah hopefully you'll find some new places to add to your map um all right well thank you everyone um have a good evening and get in touch with annalise if you have something to add to the site <laughs>